Thing. Um, Shamia Fagan, I use she, her pronouns and honored to serve as Oregon Secretary of State. And my mission as Oregon Secretary of State is to build trust, to build trust between the people of Oregon and our state government so that Oregon's public services can make a positive difference in people's everyday lives. And the audits division is one of the most powerful tools that I have to fulfill that mission to make sure that Oregon's limited resources are making a real difference where they are needed the most. Today, we're here to release an advisory report from the Oregon Audits Division on water security in Oregon. I'm a child of rural Oregon. I was raised in Dufer and the Dalles, and I prioritized this audit during my first term because of what I've heard from tribes and other rural Oregonians about the need for the state to address the current and future water shortages in Oregon. I'm not going to mince words today. Water is life. And these findings in this audit report are truly shocking. Communities across Oregon do not have access to reliable, clean water today. In central, south, and eastern Oregon, Oregonians have dealt with limited water, excuse me, limited water and competing interests for a long time. In recent years, it's developed into a full-blown crisis. West of the Cascade, West of the Cascades, communities are also struggling, growing demand in properly regulated agricultural and industrial practices and increasing water temperatures are putting people at risk of experiencing water insecurity in the future. Our federally recognized tribes are unable to ensure that their people have access to clean water. And across the state, we are not immune to the mega drought that is incapacitating other parts of the Western United States. Oregon has a reputation for being rainy and wet. But that is a very Western Oregon centric reputation. I'm here to tell you that we need to be very concerned about water security, both east and west of the Cascade Mountain Range. Many of you have reported on these issues before. Thank you. What's shocking about this report is it shows that there's no plan to address the problem. As I said before, water is life. If even one family doesn't have access to clean water, we're failing. When entire communities struggle with water access, it's a crisis. I think we are in a crisis right now, and it's only going to get worse with ongoing risks such as climate change, growing populations, and aging infrastructure. So today I'm offering the Oregon Legislature and Governor Kotek a roadmap to create a statewide plan to address water security in Oregon. The advisory report we're releasing today provides a roadmap for how they can do that. The report we're releasing outlines several problems with the way Oregon handles water governance. First, it notes that we don't have a statewide plan. We do not have a coherent funding strategy or shared priorities. Second, it points out that we don't have the necessary data to support regional planning needs. Third, the report makes it clear about the lack of broad and diverse community engagement in water decisions. And finally, the report highlights the difficulties that our federally recognized tribes in Oregon experience as a result of ongoing industrial and agricultural practices that are ecologically inappropriate for Oregon's water basins. The report creates an actionable roadmap that leaders in Oregon can take to address these issues. These steps include developing a statewide governance model, broadening community engagement and improving data collection and more. The advisory report from the auditors is detailed, it is nuanced, and most importantly, it is actionable. In summary, we need a damn water plan. Far too many families lack access to clean water today, and many communities in Oregon are at high risk of becoming water insecure in the very near future. So I'll say it again, this is a crisis. Water demands urgent action, and this report gives legislators and Governor Kotek the critical information needed to immediately begin work on a statewide plan that will ensure every Oregonian has access to clean water now and for years to come. The Audits Division has done incredible work, as always, in this report that could make a real difference in people's lives. I want to thank our team again for the high standards and professionalism they put into this advisory report and every audit that they do. With that, I want to introduce Kip Mehmet, the director of the Oregon's Audits Division. Good morning, Secretary Fagan. Thank you so much for those great comments. And good morning, everybody. Kip Mehmet, I'm the audit director for the Secretary of State's office. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, again, want to thank the Secretary always for her great uh, comments and really synopsis of our report. Uh, she did a great job because it is a long report. 
but we really encourage you to read it. It's very reader. The team's done a great job. Reader friendly, I should say. It's very, um, we've got stories. We've highlighted some of the, the, the graphics around it. So we know it's long, but water, as the secretary said, it's, it, there's no more valuable commodity. Um, it's a basic human need. Uh, yet it's a, a limited and diminishing commodity and, and with high competing demands and real concerns about equitable access, as the Secretary really laid out. So this is one of several advisory reports that the division has released recently. We've also looked at advisory reports covering a wide range of topics, systematic re risk related to K-12 education, domestic terrorism, long-term health uh, care facility safety protocols and wildfire cleanup efforts. And the reason we issue these advisory reports is they really examine system-wide risk. Um, and we use them as a tool. Audits generally set up for a department, a program, or a service. And we do those audits, and they're important. But we also have information as auditors that look at systemic risk. And that's what this report is really aimed at, is not a specific water department or policy, but really how we're managing our whole water process. And again, uh, uh, as the Secretary noted, a lot of external partners from the federal government to uh, private industry and so forth. So we're really proud that this is another type of tool we use to really maximize both our talent and the work we do here. Um, last point I want to make before we get to your good questions um, is really that we really want to highlight, as the Secretary touched on, our interaction with the community. You know, auditors don't sit back in, in the Kafka walls of government. Uh, we actually get out and talk to people. Uh, and our audit teams travel broadly around the state to, state to talk to rural areas, coastal communities struggling, and particularly with our tribal governments. And I just want to thank our tribal governments for the hospitality that they showed us. Uh, and for our respectful government to government relationship that we adhere under, specifically under Secretary Fagan's administration. So we thank those tribes and those tribes, many of them are, are struggling in this area. And we've highlighted some of their stories here as well. Uh, I also want to thank all the state water officials. We talked to a lot of different officials. We have a lot of people, good people working on this issue, and we thank them for their time. Having said that, let me just introduce the audit team real quick. That's uh, the, the project was led by Olivia Raquette, who's our audit manager. Bonnie Crawford did a fantastic job as the lead, and Wendy Cam and Ariana Denny were the staff auditors for this project. Ben, I'll turn it over to you for the question and answer section. Thanks, Kip. All right. Um... Let's see, we'll start taking questions as we get them. And like I said at the beginning, if you could use the uh, raise your hand feature in Zoom to queue up. If you have any issues with that, feel free to drop a chat as well. Uh, the first hand I see is from Alex. Alex, go ahead. Hey, y'all. Um, I was wondering, one of the issues that gets brought up in the report is the highly litigious environment as a problem facing water planning. But I didn't see much about that beyond mention. Can you tell us a little bit more about how big of an issue that is and give us maybe a clear cut example of how, um, yeah, people are, I guess, people or corporations or whatnot suing over water rights or regulations is hindering water planning? Bonnie or, or Olivia, I can take that at a high level and then please come in and, and fill in some of the details. But one thing is, is it's not a cop out, but auditors, you know, steer clear of looking. In fact, our standards compel us to kind of stay clear of legal matters. So we didn't really press into any specific litigation, but we did want to note that it is a real risk. And I think it ties into our bigger point that we make in the report that, right, there's a lot of different interests, private, public sector, uh, water rights. We talk a lot about water rights, grandfathered water rights and things like that. So we know, and a big part of what we're envisioning here in this report, and it's aspirational, but it has to be done, is that community engagement. Because we have a little good commodity, people need it, organizations, uh, businesses need it, and the thought that they're just going to voluntarily give that up uh, in, the, in, the, in the goodness of all society isn't going to happen. So while we didn't get specifically into litigation strategy, we, we did want to notice a real deal and we don't have a solution for it other than we hope through, um, you know, enhanced communications and trade-offs and, and uh, those kind of public policy kind of um, development processes we could get to that. Bonnie or Olivia, can you, can you help a little bit more on that question? I can add a little bit more here. Um, uh, reiterating what Kip had said, we didn't get into specific cases, but when it comes to water, especially when we're looking into a plan or coordination, it's important to take into consideration that uh, the the litigation that comes with with it. And most of the water rights, you know, concerns or water rights disagreements, the only avenue that they can go to to get 
things settle is through the litigation uh, process. And that is costly, it takes time. And one of the examples is when the tribes go to have these rights, you know, addressed in the court system, it takes years and years before decisions are made um, and for them to then move forward with plants that they have. So yes, we didn't go deeply into what the different um, lawsuits are currently in place, but we wanna emphasize that it is a factor that needs to be considered when the state is going forward with uh, a plan. Thank you for that. Uh, the next hand I saw was from Annette. Annette, go ahead. Hi, good morning, everybody. Yeah, I know this is something that isn't necessarily new. I mean, the last several years, we've seen trends, for example, the Colorado rivers running low, the drought, the wildfires. This is a problem hitting all across the West. Um, two questions here. Are we looking realistically at a future where states are going to have to compete for water? And what is the cost going to be to make make sure we have reserves of water that are equitable across the state for both business and consumers and rural and urban areas? Well, if we had that answer, we would have the solution, right? But it's a great question. And I, I do think, and again, I don't want to get too far over my skis uh, on the technical uh, knowledge here, but the regional solutions, right? All, water does not observe boundaries. It doesn't stop flowing at borders, at international borders, at tribal borders, at local government borders. So um, the idea that there are, that there doesn't need to be regional engagement, and I'm glad you brought up the Southwest United States. I personally spent a lot of time there. Grew up in Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake. Uh, that many of us know is project, projected by some to dry up in five years. So this is a big Western issue. So we, again, we're at a higher level. You're right, it's not new, but we just thought it would be a great orchestration to pull all of this mapping together, all of what's being done to kind of lay the surface. So I, I don't want to get too deep into that particular regional planning, but there is no way we can do good governance in the space if you do not bring in all those, uh, not just in state, but out of state. Uh, and maybe even internationally with Canada and others to look at these solutions downstream. But uh, Olivia, any any input from you? I'll add a little bit. So the the secretary mentioned that we have a crisis today. So it's not enough to say in the future what will happen. It's like act now because one and we mentioned this in the report there are decisions and plans and and things that happened in the past that led us to today and so some of those things are uh, for example not sustaining the efforts that are in place or were put in place and so we're at this juncture today where there is a crisis even though we're a wet state so it is it is, I'm hoping that we don't look too far into the future, but we start today and we in this in this report will inform the legislature and the governor's office kind of what has worked in the past, what needs support moving forward, and then how do we come together to make sure that people today, people's water needs today are met because there are folks in the state who need water on a daily basis bottled water because their water is not safe. And then in terms of kind of the second question when it comes to the cost, the cost is enormous. And part of that is because it has been underfunded in the past. And so the underfunding has been accumulating to this point. So right now it feels like whatever new funding we get is catching up on past um, efforts that have not been sustained. So it is, it is a big task and we're hoping that this report will kind of provide a roadmap for our um, state leaders to move off, move us forward into the future. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Bonnie Crawford. I would just add um, one point to that. Those are excellent points. Um, issues around competition and cost are a, a present concern for Oregon. We have certain waterways such as the Columbia River, the Klamath River that cross state lines. And um, there are concerns about the need to develop or update agreements that are already in place for these waterways. So it is it is something that is happening now and that the costs are an issue now. Great, thank you very much. Um, Alex, we'll come back to you for another question. Hey, thanks. Um, so going through this, and I guess sort of to piggyback on what we were just talking about, it sounds like there's a really fractured regulatory environment on water quality and quantity in the state. Um, 
it sounds like the water resources department primarily has the planning role and that that's, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that seems to be the big issue here. Is there an argument being made in this that such a department should not exist or rather be wrapped into existing regulatory agencies? It, it seems to me that one of the big takeaways was the water resources department is not in fact uh, serving a super powerful role and it's competing for resources with other agencies that might be better equipped to do it. I could jump on that and then the team can add to it. Um, part of our work was not to identify whether an existing agency or an existing coordinate, uh, uh, entity should stop what they're doing or discontinue uh, what they're doing. We are here to uh, promote and build on what these great agencies have been doing in the past years to try and move the state forward when it comes to water um, insecurity. So the water department, uh, we are not suggesting that their roles should be changed or they should you know, leave the water um, arena, but they need support. They have statutory authority to do specific things when it comes to water, but they need support in terms of resources, in terms of direction, in terms of guidance. And we are thinking and hoping that this report will provide the legislature and the governor's office the kind of support that the water resources department needs moving forward. And not just on their own, but in coordination with the other 13 plus um, water related agencies um, in our state. And I can just jump on top of that, Alex. A great question. You know, it's something we see as auditors a lot, and and it's it's not without you know casting blame. It's just the the siloed nature of government, you know, and the evolution of government over time. And so I I think good to your question is yeah, as as Libby said, we're not out, we're not recommending any abolishment of any department or even any fundamental changes to roles because we weren't that level. But what we're suggesting by this roadmap is we really need to look at our framing. How are our state agencies structured? And, and really to this question of water sustainability, you know, there's so many other questions that could come up with water, but really the, the, the least among us, if you will, how are we getting them water that's not in bottles? So um, we, we're not directly coming out and suggesting what you're saying, but it's not an unfair read to say, hey, we've got to look at what we're doing here with water policy and how we've structured our government apparatus, state government apparatus, to make sure it's the most effective. One last point, and I know the team will echo this, the water community in the state government do share a lot of information. They have committees. They they are talking. Of course, they're passionate about this. So we're not trying to throw any shade at them at all. But I do think, you know, from that auditor perspective, there's a lot of um, disjointedness and, and possibilities for redundancy and gaps as well in, in our service delivery. Um, and just to add to that, um, and I hope I'm not repeating what other people are saying, but WRD, and I do want to make this point, they are a very important, they are a critical player. Uh, they just don't have the capacity or the authority to direct statewide planning. Um, coordination as well is a real challenge for all of Oregon's natural resource agencies. They tend to be very small, and there are quite a few of them. A coordinating body um, leading a statewide plan around a regional framework can take on a role that state agencies are very hard pressed to do as individual agencies. Thank you, Don. Do we have any additional questions? Alex, go ahead. Um, sorry, all I got plenty of lingering thoughts. Um, I'm wondering, one of the issues that I see come up in my reporting on water is a lack, even between the local and state agencies, a lack of trust or, um, yeah, just, I guess that's what it comes down to fundamentally is a lack of trust in the data being shared and sort of you have industry coming with their data, local uh, stakeholders coming in with their data, the state coming in with their data, state agencies having conflicting data. To what degree does Oregon's water planning need like a federal uh, partner, whether it be the U.S. Geological Survey, people who are studying sort of groundwater hydrogeology? Um, is that at all a part of your recommendations, I guess, to the legislature and the governor that there needs to be more coordination with these federal agencies on that level, on the data level? So 
So I think, again, great question, Alex, by the way, uh, at, at a high level, we, we, we nibble around that. We, we do put that out about the, you know, the, the partnership data you're absolutely right on. I mean, that's what, that's the auditor's world is trying to find the right data and, and, and analyzing that the right way. But it goes to your, the, or a prior question about regional solutions. The federal government plays a huge role as they have in the Southwest United States and had to intervene uh, in those regional areas as well. So um, we didn't explicitly recommend that, uh, you know, around federal and data. It's a great idea. But uh, again, I think our gist of our report is, you know, we've got to bring all the people to the play table, including the federal government, to best um, best allocate this uh, limited commodity. So it's a great question. Um, but yeah, we didn't get too far into the weeds in, in terms of the federal government's intervention here in Oregon. Uh, Olivia or Bonnie, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, just one thing I would add, um, we are already working with the federal government um, back in the, the 80s and 90s. And um, prior to that, Oregon had a number of uh, basin studies that were conducted by WRD. That basin program um, has since been shut down. And since that time, Oregon has partnered uh, with the USGS um, and I believe some other federal agencies to actually uh, continue conducting some basin studies. So it is critical that we maintain the relationship that we have with them. Um, I think, yes, they, they do need to be involved in whatever we do data-wise, but our, our um, recommendation is more pointed at the state and the state's need to enhance um, its um, the data that it has to support the decisions that we make at the state level. Can I ask one more question if nobody else, if I'm not cutting anybody off? Yes, of course. Um, so when it comes to sort of the critical groundwater management areas in the state um, that have not improved over the years, I'm thinking specifically about the lower Umatilla basin um, and sort of the the local approach, this 30 years of a voluntary committee made up of sort of local stakeholders that are supposed to have, you know, some representation from the Department of Environmental Quality and Agriculture, and those guys are supposed to report up to the state. But I, I guess I'm wondering when it comes to the states, that is, I guess, what the state's solution has been to local water problems over the last three decades there. Was there any sort of analysis of whether or not that's been an effective way to handle groundwater pollution in critical areas of Oregon? Is there any sort of, I guess, part of this audit where you make a judgment on whether or not that's been successful and should continue? Uh, thanks. I, I can th I think I can respond to that. Um, we, we didn't have a specific analysis of that exact question. Um, we did look a bit at the history around um, water planning and like watershed restoration in Oregon. Um, I would say that there are some qualified successes to the approach that we've taken. Um, but as we point out in the report, um, because we don't have a statewide plan, we really have no way of, of monitoring what's going on in each individual at, 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 you know, at the state level and in each basin. And we don't really have a way of ensuring that what's happening um, uh, adheres to statewide water security priorities or is actually in the best interests of everyone in a specific basin. Does that does that answer your question? I think so. Is the net net that um, it's worked well in some places and you're sort of waiting to see if it works well in others? Yeah, I mean, we do have some examples in the state of of good practice. If you look at the Deschutes, um, they, are, they have a very coordinated, um, apparently well-organized approach to um, uh, water governance and water management. Um, not all regions have that, however. Great. Um, not seeing any additional hands. We are about at time. Uh, so I think we'll um, close this up for the day. I just want to thank everybody for, for jumping on today and participating in this. Um, if you have any additional questions you'd like to send our way, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm around for the rest of the day. You have my email, you have my phone number. I can connect you to our audits team or to the secretary for anything you need. And uh, yeah, just thanks again, everyone, for coming. I'll go ahead and close the meeting out, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you.